Hi, I'm Tammy Marshall, and today I'm going to share with you chapter two of my most recent novel, which is my sixth novel. This one is called Her Ride or Die. I realize the, the H in the title there kind of blends in, but again, it's called Her Ride or Die. This is a suspense mystery with a little paranormal in the mix, kind of a ghost story actually, and involving a motorcycle. So if you haven't heard me yet read the prologue or chapter one, you might want to go back and listen to those first. They're also on my YouTube channel. Uh, so this one though, is chapter two, and this one's titled, Fancy Meeting You Here, Principal McFarley. The next day, she pulled up beside a bright orange Dodge Challenger at a red light. Loud music emanated from the car's open windows. She was so focused on properly balancing her bike that she didn't even glance toward the driver until she heard a girl's voice squeal. Principal McFarley, is that you? Sighing in resignation, she raised the visor of her open face helmet and peered into the car's interior. A curly haired head came into view as the passenger leaned across the driver to wave frantically at Josephine. Hi, Rachel, Josephine said, loud enough to be heard over the rumble of her bike and the music coming from the car. How are you? Oh my God, the teenager squealed again. I can't believe you ride a Harley. The light turned green. It was nice seeing you too, Josephine yelled as she revved the throttle and took off, leaving the souped up muscle car behind her. She rolled her eyes and shook her head. When would people stop being so astounded to see her on a motorcycle. Probably never, she told herself. The car was coming up beside her again, but she wanted to avoid more of Rachel's high-pitched squeals. So she shifted down, flicked on her blinker, and turned onto a side street. Behind her, though, she heard Rachel call out, Bye, Principal McFarley. See you on Monday. Josephine laughed. She could hear it now. Students who didn't already know she had purchased a bike, would all know it come Monday morning because Rachel loved nothing more than to share all the latest news with everyone at school. She suspected that Rachel was at this very moment telling her friends via whatever online social means she preferred. Uh, then she groaned as she realized <clears throat> that Rachel might even have taken a photo of her. Oh, just what I need, she muttered to herself beneath her helmet. To shake off the annoyance that Rachel's presence had brought to her otherwise enjoyable outing, she took a zigzag, meandering course to her destination, a bar. Now, she had no plans for a midday drink, nor did she want to join a biker gang, as might otherwise be evidenced by the assortment of motorcycles parked outside the sports bar. Instead, she was taking part in her first poker run. She'd heard of them before, but she didn't know how one worked, and she was both nervous and excited about trying one. She pulled into the parking lot and left her bike amidst the others parked there. A poster taped to the front door welcomed bikers to the 25th annual poker run and informed them that all entry fees were going to help fund rehabilitation for fellow bikers who'd been injured while riding. She swallowed when she read that. Of course, she was aware of the risks involved in riding her bike, especially on the highway, but she was also aware of the risks she took every day while driving her Jeep or while running a high school full of high-strung, overactive teenagers or while simply facing any of the myriad challenges of life. She was glad to help others who loved to ride and who had, unfortunately, been harmed doing the thing they enjoyed doing, but she hoped that she'd never become one of them herself. After entering the bar, she looked around to see if there might be somebody in there she knew. She doubted it because her life as a principal didn't allow for many opportunities to get out and socialize, and the thing she did for her school couldn't be classified as social outings anyway. Surprisingly, though, her search found a familiar face, but it wasn't one she wanted to see. The man she was gazing at registered even more surprise when he saw her. He set his beer down onto the bar top with such a thunk that she heard it over the noise of other bikers milling around. Not wanting to be rude, she walked toward him with a big smile. 
Well, hello, Doug. Nice to see you. He smirked. Ha. Fancy meeting you here, Principal McFarley. She held her smile, even though it threatened to fade. Now, Doug, I'm not your principal anymore. No need for titles among adults. He took a swig of his beer as he assessed her with his eyes. She remembered those eyes. They were the eyes of a troublemaker, of a boy who had been in her office on a weekly basis about ten years ago and who didn't seem to have changed at all for the better upon graduation. What brings you here? He finally asked her. She pointed to the registration table where a few bikers were waiting in line. He laughed. You? He looked behind her, but then he must have realized that she was alone. So he repeated, you? She smiled, but it was forced now. Yes, me. So if you'll excuse me, I'm going to sign up now. She took a step away. It was good to see you, Doug. He snorted. <clears throat> Wish I could say the same, Principal McFarley, he said pointedly and loudly for all to hear. Most of the other patrons and bikers ignored him, but one man turned toward her as she passed him. What school? he asked. She stopped. Excuse me? What school? he repeated a little louder. Oh. She looked around and was glad to see that nobody else was listening or even showing any interest in her. Uh, Northwest Junior Senior High. She noticed that his eyebrows went up a notch. Do you know the school? He shook his head. No, not really. I've heard it's a little rough, that's all. She turned her full attention upon him. Now she was beginning to feel angry at herself for thinking that this poker run might be a fun and stress-free way to spend her Saturday. Rough? I'd hardly call it that, she began, but the man interrupted her. I, I didn't mean to insult you. Sorry, I, I heard that from my niece, and she goes to South, so who knows why she thinks that about your school. Josephine relaxed and tried to smile again. <laughs> That explains it. The two schools have long been rivals in sports and embroiled in silly crosstown fighting. They both are excellent schools. I'm a friend of the principal for South, and he runs a tight ship over there. Your niece is in good hands. That's good to know, the man said. Again, I'm sorry. That was a horrible thing for me to say about your school. Leave it to me to make the wrong first impression. He stuck out his hand. I'm Joe. She laughed louder than she meant to, and covered her mouth. She took his hand and shook it. <laughs> now I need to apologize. I didn't mean to laugh like that. It's just that my name is Joe, too, so it struck me as funny. That's all. He raised a quizzical eyebrow. Joe? With an E? Joe. No E. Short for Josephine. You can call me Josephine if you'd prefer. Casually, though, I usually go by Joe. He smiled. <laughs> you look like a Joe. Together we can be Joe Joe. She laughed again and chided herself for sounding like a hyena. <laughs> Sorry, my mother calls me Joe Joe. Well, well, she used to call me that when I was a little girl. He looked at her new leather jacket and then down at her barely scuffed boots. First time? She grimaced because she had hoped no one would notice that she was a poker run virgin. That obvious, huh? She ran her eyes over his well-used boots and heavily patched vest. He nodded. Hey, everyone has to start sometime, right? She smiled. Better late than never, and whatever other cliches we can think of, he gestured to the registration desk. After you. She approached the table and was greeted by a woman wearing a plunging leather vest with nothing underneath. A tattoo of a flaming bike stretched across her ample cleavage, and Joe averted her gaze so she wouldn't be caught staring at it. The woman's eyes danced as they met hers. Like my tat? she asked. Joe blushed as the woman tugged at the edge of her vest. Want to see the whole thing? Joe blurted, no thanks. Behind her, Joe said, Maggie, please. This isn't a peep show. Just sign the woman up. Maggie smirked. Yes, G.I. Joe, sir. Can it, Mags? Maggie shot Joe a look, but she immediately took on a more professional demeanor. I'm sorry, ma'am. Name? Josephine gave her the information she needed and took the proffered sheet. On it, she saw five checkpoints scattered inside and outside the city. She turned to Joe. So I go to these places and draw a card? He nodded and grinned at her. Yes, that's right. Ever played poker? She swallowed and shook her head. 
she suddenly felt silly taking on a bike ride and a new activity like poker all in one fell swoop. He placed a hand on her shoulder. Hey, don't worry about it. It's not like a real poker game. It'll be fun. He stepped toward the door. Come on, ride with me, at least to the first checkpoint. He turned and looked at her. She set her jaw and raised her chin. Um, thanks, Joe. I think I will. But I need to warn you that I don't ride very fast yet. That's all right. This isn't a race. It isn't who gets there first. It's who has the best poker hand when all is said and done. They stepped outside and strolled toward their bikes. She asked him, So is the money going for anyone specific? He paused as he snapped his vest shut over his black t-shirt. A buddy of mine is paralyzed from an accident with a truck last year. We're hoping to fund a motorized wheelchair for him. Oh, I'm sorry. He shook his head. No need to apologize. It happens. Just remember to always be on the lookout while riding. A lot of drivers don't pay attention the way they should, especially to bikers. I ride a big bike, yet I've had lots of close calls with idiots who either don't see me or are too busy on their damn phones to watch where they're going. He pulled a helmet out of the carrier mounted on the back of a large touring bike. Wow, that's a nice bike, she said as she ran her eyes over all the extra features. What, this old thing? It's just something I take out when I don't want to impress anybody, he joked. You should see the one I ride when I really want to impress the ladies. His eyes danced a little and his mouth twitched. She felt a warmth spread across her cheeks, so she looked away and pointed at her own bike. That's mine. He whistled. Pretty nice. I like the color. She nodded. Me too. I love that shade of blue. Sort of a cobalt, I'd say. She watched as he mounted his bike and then noticed the tattoo peeking out from under his t-shirt sleeve. Is that why she called you G.I. Joe? She asked as she gestured to it. He glanced down at his arm and nodded. Maggie is a smart ass who's also a pain in the ass. I made the mistake of dating her once and believe me, once was enough. Since I didn't want to see her after that, she loves to get little digs in about my service because she knows it meant a lot to me. Josephine shook her head in disbelief. Well, ignore her. What branch? Army, 10 years. Did a stint overseas that changed my whole life. He fastened the strap of his helmet. It's why I turned to writing when I got home. I value my freedom. And this is the closest thing to true freedom I've ever felt. He looked at her. Ready to go? She snapped the strap of her helmet into place and mounted her bike, a little self-consciously, because she wasn't confident concerning everything about her bike yet. Joe punched the ignition switch and his machine roared into life. The deep rumble sent a shiver of thrill through Josephine, and she yelled over the sound of it, You take the lead! He nodded and inched forward. She started her own bike and moved into position to follow him. Then he pulled into the road, effortlessly leaning into the turn. Josephine followed behind him a solid car length. She didn't want to ride too closely because she wasn't smooth with her downshifting. She was already dreading the first stoplight they came to because she exhibited a, a noticeable wobble when coming to a full stop. Just as those worries were circulating in her head, the light turned yellow. Joe glided through the intersection, but she jerked to a halt, relieved that her first stop wasn't next to him. She did notice with a small sense of joy that Joe pulled over midway up the block to wait for her. The light changed to green, and she moved forward. Joe merged with the traffic and pulled in front of her again. She, he raised his left hand in a wave, but she merely nodded in return, too nervous to take a hand off the grips yet. Fortunately, the remaining light stayed green and she followed Joe's lead. She had forgotten where they were going for the first checkpoint and prayed that she didn't lose him. She chastised herself for not paying closer attention to the map on the sheet that was now tucked away in her vest pocket. How many times had she, during those years that she was a high school history teacher, lectured her students to read the directions? Suddenly, she noticed that she was gaining on Joe's bike, so she braked and flicked on her left blinker to match his. They turned onto a side street, and Joe motioned for her to pull up alongside him. She did so, but was careful to leave a lot of distance between their bikes. When he noticed the chasm that existed between them, he laughed and narrowed the distance. She swallowed, both from nervousness and from embarrassment. He seemed so relaxed on his large bike, 
writing now with his left hand resting on his thigh while she still had a death hold on her hand grips. He turned his head toward her and loudly said, I know a shortcut in case you were wondering where I was taking you. She smiled to cover her uncertainty. She wasn't about to tell him that she hadn't even known the way in the first place. Instead, she yelled, I was starting to wonder if you knew where we were going. He laughed. Trust me. I will if you give me some space again. She admitted her discomfort because a car was approaching from the opposite direction. He smiled and flipped his visor back into place. Then he saluted her and pulled ahead, allowing her to move comfortably behind him as they traveled through a neighborhood of older, well-maintained two-story homes and small, well-kept lawns. They rode past an elementary school. He slowed once again, pointed and yelled, My old school! She nodded to acknowledge that she'd heard him. She glanced at the brick building. Washington Elementary, the name of many primary schools across the country. She knew the principal, naturally, but she couldn't think of any of the rest of the staff. Soon they pulled up in front of a VFW post where several other bikes were haphazardly parked near the open side door. Doug was sitting astride his bike, preparing to dismount. He removed his helmet and eyed her strangely as she parked her bike. She noticed his gaze sweep across her motorcycle, and she chuckled inwardly. <sighs> Just like Rachel, minus the squeal of delight, she thought. She and Joe went inside, and Joe greeted most of the bikers by name. He introduced Josephine to a few, and while she was grateful to him, she also felt self-conscious because some of the writers were looking at her, assessing her as though she were Joe's girlfriend. After drawing her playing card, a ten of hearts, and recording it on a sheet, she turned to Joe and said, Thanks for bringing me this far. I should try the rest on my own. His broad smile wilted, but he stuck out his hand and she shook it. No problem. I'll see you at the final checkpoint. We can compare hands. She looked into his green eyes and wondered how old he was. He was younger than she was, but she wasn't sure by how many years. Then she mentally slapped herself as she thought, Get real, Joe. He wouldn't be interested in you anyway. He's clearly a free spirit, and you are an uptight high school principal. Seeing that he'd drawn a three of clubs for his first card, she said, I've got you beat so far, right? He chuckled. Let it play out. As she moved away, he said, Want to make it interesting? She hesitated before turning to see him gazing at her with a wicked gleam in his eye. What do you have in mind? Loser buys the winner's supper. He paused as she looked down at her boots. Unless you have other plans for supper. Of course, we could always do it another night. She didn't answer, so he stepped closer to her and said in a low voice, I've never been on a date with a principal before. At that, she looked at him and said, Perhaps not, but I have a suspicion you've spent a lot of time with a few in your lifetime. Oh, the ladies got spunk, he replied with a laugh. He leaned even closer. I'll tell you all about my time in the principal's office over supper tonight your treat. She cocked her head. Prepare to be schooled, young man. I'll see you at the finish line. Then she sauntered off toward the door, showing more outward swagger than her inner self was capable of feeling. She stepped outside and took a deep breath of fresh air. What the hell am I doing? She asked herself. And then she immediately answered, I'm having fun. Have you forgotten what that is? She nodded an answer as she walked to her bike, threw a leg over it, and pulled on her helmet. A couple of the nearby bikers must have mistaken her nods as nods of greeting, because they nodded at her in return. Under her visor, she smiled and stifled a laugh. Then she started her fat boy, felt the growl of the magnificent beast under her seat, shifted down to first, and took off toward checkpoint number two at a roadside bar in a small town a few miles away. So that was chapter two of Her Ride or Die. Again, it's, it's available in paperback on Amazon, uh, and it's also available as an ebook. I hope that you will come back for the next chapter or get your own copy. Thanks.